Okay, members. It's now time for questions to the Executive Office, and I call Rosemary Barton to ask the first question. Ms. Barton. First Minister, question one. And I call the First Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, I will take questions one, four, and ten together. The EU rules that will apply here following the transition period are set out in the protocol. The Joint Committee on the Withdrawal Agreement has responsibilities regarding the implementation and application of the protocol. The UK and the EU announced on the 8th of December that they had agreed in principle on key decisions to be made by the Committee relating to at-risk goods, agricultural subsidies, customs exemptions for fish and aquaculture, and EU oversight. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster spoke to both the Deputy First Minister and myself after the announcement to explain those decisions and how they will help to ensure that the daily lives of our businesses and citizens' lives will not be adversely affected. The draft joint decisions of the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee has now been published and we are analysing the text. It is expected that these issues will be brought formally to the next meeting of the Committee, the date of which is expected to depend on the outcome of the negotiations on the future relationship. Over recent weeks, the UK and the EU have intensified their negotiations with the aim of securing an agreement. Yesterday, the Prime Minister and the President of the European Commission announced that the negotiations will continue to see if an agreement can be reached. We recognise that the talks could still result in a non-negotiated outcome and that the delays to this process have added further pressure to the already challenging timeline to prepare for the end of the transition period. An, underlying, uh, an understanding of the text published last week and further clarity is needed on any agreed deal to inform our planning. Our officials have worked with officials from other departments in order to scrutinise readiness issues and identify possible mitigations. The Executive has considered the outcome of this work and agreed to focus on the priority high-impact risks to operational readiness. Based on our planning for operational readiness, Departments have also identified the residual risks that would remain in the event of a non-negotiated outcome, which are forming the basis of cross-Northern Ireland civil service contingency plans. Our preparations for a non-negotiated outcome are being taken forward in conjunction with the COVID-19 response and the normal planning for winter issues to ensure we are prepared for any concurrent risks that may arise. Thank you. And I call Rosemary Barton Supplementary. Thank you, First Minister, for your answer so far. First Minister, can you also give us an update now on the Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, I uh, hope that I did set out the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol and uh, the agreement that was reached between the European Union and uh, the UK Government uh, in the form of Maurice Sastrovich and uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove. As I've said, we are analysing the text from uh, that agreement, and obviously we are also hoping uh, that the current negotiations will bring us to a free trade agreement. Uh, of course, we are watching very carefully how those negotiations take place. I call Janet Dolan. Um, Minister, uh, do you share my concern that Brexit, and particularly a non-negotiated Brexit outcome, will have devastating long-term economic consequences, particularly along the border corridor and in rural communities like our own? Well, as you know, the executive have different views in relation to uh, Brexit. Of course, the uh, executive office does not have uh, an agreed position in relation to Brexit. Uh, from my own point, I think there are many opportunities to be had uh, from leaving the European Union and all of the regulations that are imposed upon us uh, by non-accountable EU uh, Commission. So I look forward to taking up those opportunities. Undoubtedly, it would be much better if we had a negotiated settlement, and we hope that that will be the case at the end of these negotiations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for the answers to the questions so far. First Minister, what work is being done with those sectors that were most uh, uh, impacted by tariff rises in the instance of a no deal, such as uh, car dealers? Well, I take it he means uh, second-hand car dealers uh, in terms of coming across from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. Uh, that is an issue that is still being considered in Westminster. I understand Robin Walker, the Minister of State in the NIO, is dealing with that matter with Her Majesty's Treasury to try and find a workable solution. Um, of course, uh, there is always the stopgap 
in the protocol of Article 16, which says that if there's any damage uh, to the economic well-being of the people of Northern Ireland, that the United Kingdom government can intervene uh, in an appropriate and measured way. Uh, we will be reminding, I certainly will be reminding uh, the Chancellor to the Duchy of Lancaster and the government of that commitment in Article 16 of the protocol. I call Jim Allister. Um, the First Minister knows and indeed has propounded the very destructive nature of the protocol in terms of the economic and constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom. I therefore must ask her, why is her agriculture minister building the very infrastructure for the Irish Sea border at our ports over her blood red, red lines? And why did she and her MLAs vote last Tuesday to bring in, in perpetuity, 45 EU directives and uh, regulations so as to help implement the protocol? Well, of course, uh, as the member well knows, they are not brought in in perpetuity. They are, can be revisited again by this place, and that is the whole point about us leaving the European Union, that this Assembly can revisit those regulations, and that is in uh, the protocol. And look, let's be very clear. Uh, I've, my party voted against the protocol. We oppose the protocol at every level. Uh, not once did the sea border pass through the House of Commons uh, when we held the balance of power. The general election then happened, and we were faced uh, with the protocol and the withdrawal agreement as it currently is. We have worked very hard to mitigate against the worst excesses of the protocol, and we will continue to do so. We have made some progress in relation to those matters, and I hope that we can make more progress. Thank you. I call Martina Anderson. Good. And, uh, First Minister, notwithstanding your own views of the protocol, do you agree that it does prevent a hardening of the border in Ireland, protects the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts, and preserves the all-Ireland economy? Well, first of all, I would hope that she would know that the Belfast Agreement is also about east-west as well as north-south. Uh, and, of course, our biggest market is with Great Britain. Uh, I do welcome the fact that the unfettered access promised in the command paper uh, is now something that seems to be protected by the recent agreement. Uh, what we need to ensure is that there is also unfettered access for, from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, and then we will continue uh, with that work because we think it is very important for our businesses and our citizens. So when we talk about uh, the Belfast Agreement, it is important that we reflect on the whole of the Belfast Agreement and not just parts of it. I call Steve Egan. Comments so far. And may I refer to when she talks about Article 16. Can she envisage a time when both the First and Deputy First Ministers through the Joint Committee could they have a formal mechanism where they could invoke Article 16 rather than relying on the two co-chairs of the Joint Committee, which, of course, as we all reminded are, is one from the European Union and one from the United Kingdom. Well, I think that uh, Article 16 of uh, the protocol, it's not for the Joint Committee. It's actually for the UK government. Uh, if the UK government believes that it will lead to uh, serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties, the Union of the United, Ki or the United Kingdom may unilaterally take appropriate safeguard measures. So it is not for uh, a joint agreement in relation to those issues. It is for the UK government if they believe that Northern Ireland has been damaged by the operation of the protocol. I call Christopher Stafford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sir, since 1998, the founding principle of how this place is governed is that of parallel consent. Can I invite my right hon. Friend, the First Minister, to state to this House and to the wider public the Unionist people of Northern Ireland do not consent to the provisions of this protocol? And will she agree with me that Article 16, the preparedness of the Government to use Article 16 in the national interest, will demonstrate to us all just how Unionist the Conservative and Unionist Party actually is? Well, as the member points out, uh, there is certainly no consent for the protocol from the representatives of the Unionist people uh, at Westminster. Uh, we voted against it on every single occasion. 
However, given the scope of the Conservative and Unionist Party's um, win at the last general election when a, an 80-seat majority was put in place, uh, it was a case that this uh, protocol could not then be stopped. So we had to make sure that we mitigated against the worst excesses of the protocol. Uh, we have made some progress in relation to that, but of course there is still much work to do. And I want to assure the member that this uh, Leader and First Minister will not be found wanting when there is work to do to try and mitigate against the worst excesses uh, of the European Union and the protocol. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you for letting me in there. Um, Miss, uh, to, to the First Minister, um, Brexit is happening, the protocol is happening. Uh, people in Northern Ireland did not ask for either. Uh, the second is a response to the first. Can I ask her now that it is happening, will she use her office to do everything to take advantage of possible benefits from Northern Ireland of access to EU trade deals? Will she and the Deputy First Minister uh, advance together the interests of Northern Ireland? We need access to those trade deals. Um, businesses here are asking for that. And I think businesses are asking for access to their main market in Great Britain and make sure that they get their goods over from Great Britain into Northern Ireland as well. And that is, of course, uh, my priority and to make sure that we use uh, my good office to do that. But of course, we will take any benefits that flow uh, from the protocol. It has been a very difficult period for us all in relation uh, to this, and I think it's important to look at access to UK trade deals. Uh, those deals are now beginning uh, to become a reality, and it's very important that we have full access to those trade deals, and that's part of the ongoing work uh, to ensure that we have access to those trade deals. Moving on, and I call Gordon Dunn. Question two, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Kenahan was a, recently appointed as the Veterans Commissioner by the Secretary of State. The introduction of UK wide legislation to further incorporate the Armed Forces Covenant into law and the appointment of a Northern Ireland Veterans Commissioner are contained in Annex A of the New Decade New Approach and are listed as commitments of the United Kingdom Government. From my own point of view, the Commissioner will act as a voice and advocate for veterans as they make the transition to civilian life by first and foremost making himself accessible to veterans. He will listen to their needs and do his best to ensure that they are given the best opportunities to positively contribute to and benefit from the society they are part of. This is a non-statutory rule. The Commissioner will therefore have no statutory power. He will provide analysis and advice on issues affecting veterans when requested. Since his appointment in late August, we understand the Commissioner has been meeting stakeholders across the Veterans Support Network including those in charitable organisations and local councils, to deepen his understanding of the issues facing veterans here. I am sure he would be a strong advocate for the interests of the estimated 150,000 veterans living here. Gordon Dunn, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer, and I welcome the support for her veterans who have given so much for our country. Can I ask the First Minister how she responds to the announcement earlier today by the Secretary of State to mark the centenary of her great country, Northern Ireland, which is part of the new decade, new approach. Yes, very much welcome the announcement by the Secretary of State today that he has uh, put forward uh, the UK government's plans to mark Northern Ireland's centenary year. Uh, there's a, a new logo put out, a new website, uh, and at uh, a policy exchange event uh, earlier on today, he announced £3 million will be made available for events taking place right across Northern Ireland. So we do welcome uh, the fact that this is part of the new decade, new approach. It has therefore been implemented by the United Kingdom Government, and we look forward to being able to commemorate and celebrate the centenary of Northern Ireland next year. And I call Dolores Kelly. And I would uh, congratulate Mr Kenahan on his appointment. I'm, doing, I'm sure he'll do a very fine job. Um, First Minister, can you advise whether or not uh, there will be any staff uh, in his office in, uh, and whether or not you have any concerns around the recruitment of that, given that there are still unfilled posts within the Historical Institutional Abuse Victims Office? As I understand it, um, the staff will uh, come uh, at the moment from the Northern Ireland office. They will be seconded into Mr Kinnahan's office. Uh, I think he has one or two staff seconded into him, but it, as it's a non-statutory role, I think it's the NIO that's going to provide the staffing complement for Mr Kinnahan. Um, yesterday, I attended the funeral of a friend, a neighbour of mine, Patrick O'Hagan. 
who, as an eight-year-old child, both him and his brothers witnessed the murder of their mother, Kathleen, in their family home. There has been no proper investigation carried in, into Kathleen's death, and has pointed towards the, the dark forces of collusion in her murder. Will the Minister agree with me that no one is above the law, including veterans, whose members of the British uh, State Forces were involved in murder and criminality? Well, I am very happy to confirm to a member of Sinn Féin that nobody is above the law, yeah. and everybody should uh, face justice if they have done uh, something that is not within uh, the legal uh, purview of the uh, place where they live and reside. Uh, I find it incredible uh, that I am challenged about collusion when we are talking about our armed forces veterans who have lived with such difficulties throughout the years. What we are trying to do is to help them get through what have been very difficult times for them as they have come under attack and low-level intimidation whilst living in their community. And I hope that Mr Kinahan can listen and help and advise those people uh, as they move forward with their lives after dealing with some very, very dif difficult circumstances in their lives. Nicole Andy Allen. Outside, can I declare an interest as a veteran myself, and indeed I have witnessed firsthand some of those difficulties that the First Minister alludes to. Uh, First Minister, can you advise if, with the, the appointment of the Veterans Commissioner, that you will appoint him or nominate him to the Armed Forces Covenant Reference Group, and also will the Executive Office work with the Commissioner to compile a report to the UK-wide Armed Forces Covenant Review? Well, I thank the member for his question, and he raises a very important point, because to date there has not been agreement. Uh, in the executive office to appoint somebody to that group. Um, that disappoints me because I think the voice of veterans in Northern Ireland needs to be heard uh, within that group. But it's a matter uh, which we have been unfortunately not able to reach agreement. I am pleased, however, to tell the member uh, that in Westminster uh, the Armed Forces Bill will come to the floor of the House in January and that will provide for the Armed Forces Covenant to be made a legal duty on this place and right across uh, the United Kingdom. I think that's very important because there are still people who don't get access to services in the way that they should. And when this Armed Forces Covenant comes into place in Westminster, it will apply here in Northern Ireland. And I think that's very important for everybody. And next question I call John Blair. Speaker, question number three. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are midway through the current 10-year strategy launched in 2015 and are continuing to progress with full implementation. Whilst we acknowledge the reference to the strategy in the New Decade New Approach document, this was in the context of the Programme for Government and a number of strategies that could underpin it. It was not explicit, nor, in our view, intended that a new racial equality strategy would be published. Our focus is very much on fully delivering the commitments set out in the current strategy, which remain critically important to achieving uh, equality and good race relations here. Supplementary John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Junior Minister for that answer. But can I ask if you would not agree that there has been uh, time wasted in successful implementation of a racial equality strategy? As even long before COVID, there had been too much lag in ensuring we move forward working alongside those within our communities and sta their representative stakeholder organisations? Well, um, Mr Speaker, I think it was very, very much the case if um, you were here during the, the debate on race relations in September time that you would have felt that frustration from members from right across the House who are reflecting the concerns of people within that sector, um, very concerned about the length of time that it has taken to, to, to make progress on this. Um, obviously, COVID has also um, been an issue that has further complicated uh, the process. We all want to, to get here with this strategy, and there is an awful lot of work that has been going on in recent months. Uh, and in particular, progress, ha progress has been made in relation to the appointment of a racial equality subgroup, along with racial equality champions in each department. A review of the Race Relations Northern Ireland order and relevant aspects of other legislation is underway. And indeed, we're moving from the review stage to the development of options and associated consultation. And a review of the delivery of the uh, Minority Ethnic Development Fund uh, is now complete, and we're considering uh, implementation on that, as well on ways in which we can tackle racist uh, bullying uh, in schools. 
Um, so much work has been done. It's slower than what we would have liked, but we're now starting to see uh, real progress, and I hope that that can continue. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, Minister, given the number of anti-racist organisations, uh, BMA groups, hum human rights organisations, have recently written to the policing board, uh, expressing their outrage at how the police responded to them on the June the 6th Black Lives Matter protest. Does the Minister agree with me that if we are how to have any semblance of racial equality, then it must be the dropping of fines, threats of prosecutions, and an apology for all those people who attended a safely uh, socially distant protest in Belfast and Derry on June 6th? Mr. Speaker, it's very important that everybody is equal under the law and equally subject uh, to the law. Uh, if, if people or organisations do not believe that that is the case, then there are very, various um, routes for them to go down, including the police ombudsman, which I think is a route that has been uh, taken as well. Let's, let me make it very clear. Uh, on behalf of the executive, there, there is no um, tolerance whatsoever for people being uh, treated differently uh, on the basis of their race. Corley. Minister, can you give an update on the key actions under the racial equality strategy, please? Um, Mr. Speaker, I hope I have already uh, done that in my um, opening remarks because we are moving forward to both in terms um, of the racial equality subgroup, the review of the race relations order, um, the minority uh, ethnic development uh, fund uh, as well. Um, one issue that I hadn't raised yet was uh, research into ethnic monitoring, and the member will be aware of that issue being discussed uh, during the debate. The final report has been uh, received and contains extensive uh, recommendations for ethnic monitoring, uh, which include amending the race relations order, uh, the, des the design phase of Encompass, the IT project overseen by Health and Social Care Board, and the uh, establishment of a data hub and a quality monitoring uh, unit. Um, the member will be aware that this is all a little bit more difficult to progress than the other issues that we have taken on board so far, um, but I hope that progress on this uh, can be made very soon. I call Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, one of the key themes is participation, representation and belonging. However, looking around this chamber, there is no great sign of that. Could the minister detail plans to promote uh, elected representation? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I would hope that um, all of us, first of all, as, as political parties, would make sure that we are not in any way a, a cold house for those from a different um, uh, ethnic and racial backgrounds. And uh, certainly, uh, I think it's something that we should be trying to do is to encourage uh, people from all backgrounds uh, to get involved in, in politics uh, and in political life here in Northern Ireland. And I think it sends a very, very strong message um, to those uh, ethnic minority communities here um, to see people uh, from their background uh, in this place. And I would certainly. Uh, encourage parties uh, and individuals to, uh, to get involved. I call Carol Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Junior Minister uh, and the Executive Office how much they have liaised with schools and the Department of Education to ensure that anti racism uh, on the school curriculum is enshrined in the racial equality strategy? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, work is ongoing with the Department of Education, in particular, on how we tackle uh, racist bullying uh, in schools. I don't have any further information on that for the member, other than that is taking place. Um, but I'd be happy to furnish her with that information. Nicole Alex Easton. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. There has been significant progress in delivering the Together Building a United Community strategy, including its headline actions. Over 20,000 young people have taken part in TBUC camps, and five urban village areas have been established. Four shared education campuses have been approved and are progressing. Ten shared neighbourhoods, providing 483 homes, have been completed. Over 4,000 young people have completed the Peace for Youth programme. Approximately 2,700 young people have engaged with the Uniting Communities Through Sport and Creativity programme. And the number of interface barriers has been reduced uh, by 14. Uh, and we provide some £19 million annually to support um, strategy delivery. Supplementary, Alex Easton. Thank you. Could I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Can the Junior Minister outline the impact of Together Building a United Community is having in North Down? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2021, um, the CGRF has awarded funding to seven projects 
that deliver in the North Down area, totalling uh, £365,682. One T-Buck camp has been delivered in the North Down Assembly area in 2021, with funding of £7,000 provided. More broadly, three camps have been delivered across the Ards and North Down Council area, with funding of nearly £18,000. Over £170,000 of funding has been provided through uh, the DCGRP in 2021 to deliver uh, 15 projects. Uh, DFC have delivered one shared neighbourhood, the Church View Development in Hollywood, and this provided 30 homes and benefits from good relations funding of £380,000. Uh, uh, £3 million of funding was awarded to Ards and North Down Borough Council through the EU's uh, Peace for programme, and CRC provides funding of uh, 245,000 organisations delivering in the Ards and North Down Council area in 2021. I hope that satisfies the, the member and the money that is going towards North Down. I call Jerry Kelly. Well, the Minister uh, commit to progress in the new departure, uh, new approach commitment um, to uh, give legal uh, expression to sectarianism as a hate crime. Um, Mr. Uh, Speaker, that is um, something I'm not aware of being considered uh, right now, but I can, of course, write uh, to the member with the uh, Executive Office's view. Nicole Dugbeady. Uh, Minister, um, future TBUC initiatives are, are, are likely to be linked with the outcomes of the FICT um, Commission. Um, can I ask the Minister uh, if he can advise if the, if the FICT report is presently being developed and, and who is the lead in that development within TEO? So it will not just be um, a consequence of what is in the um, uh, FICT report that will determine um, TBUC outcomes because, of course, it goes far beyond uh, that. And I think that would actually be a very narrow outlook to consider only um, what has been considered in the FICT report and transfer that across to TBUC. I think that that um, will be uh, a far wider. Um, but that is, will currently, uh, that's currently being um, looked at uh, by the ex Executive Office. And um, as soon as we have um, information on that, we will, of course, release it. Moving on to the next question, I call Kelly Armstrong. Question number six, please. The member will be aware that the petition of concern is not a devolved matter. Provisions to effect the changes to its operation are set out in the new decade. New approach will therefore be included in the Westminster Bill to be brought forward by the Secretary of State. The consequential amendments to standing orders will be for the Assembly to make thereafter. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. I thank the First Minister very much for her answer so far. And I asked the First Minister in the run up to the centenary of Northern Ireland, does she believe that it's time to change the designations here so people like myself and others who are designated as others will have an equal voice in this House? Well, I want to say to the member if we want to reopen all of the Belfast Agreement again, I'm sure uh, we can do that. Um, we can revisit all of those very difficult areas. For some, of course, we can't. Uh, deal with uh, issues that have already gone past in terms of the Belfast Agreement, the release of terrorist prisoners, uh, the reform, so-called, of the RUC. I would call it the destruction of the RUC. There's a lot of things in the Belfast Agreement uh, that were certainly not to my liking, and uh, she knows that that comes from the Belfast Agreement, and I'm sure if she wants to raise it in any talks process, uh, we will, of course, listen to the arguments that are made. They call Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, um, can the Minister outline when the Code of Conduct uh, will be brought before the Chamber? <coughs> Ministerial Code of Conduct. Well, as I understand it, that's a matter for the Department of Finance. I call earlier, Flynn. Nogget, uh, can call you. Um, does the Minister agree that the petition of concern should only be used for the very precise purposes of which it was intended as a cross community safeguard? Thank you. Well, again, uh, this is somewhat rewriting the Belfast Agreement, as of course there is no explanation uh, in it of, of when the petition of concern should be used. Um, but uh, others are adding things into the Belfast uh, Agreement all of the time. Uh, that's a matter for them. Uh, I did warn at the time of the Belfast Agreement, if you want to go back and look at it, uh, that the constructive ambiguity would be used in a way that maybe hadn't been foreseen at that time, and so it has proven to be the case. 
And that ends the period for a list of questions. And I call uh, Justin McNulty to ask the first question on 15 minutes of topical questions. First Minister, you will know that there is huge frustration out there at the pace of delivering support to employers, workplaces and families affected by the COVID-19 restrictions. It is particularly disappointing given that as of 2 December, 1,271 businesses who applied to Part A of the COVID-19 restrictions business support scheme had not yet received a payment. What is the First Minister's assessment of that situation and what plans does she have to raise the matter with her colleague? The economy minister. Well, all of the financial packages, whether they come from the Department of Finance, or the Department for the Economy, the Department for Communities, we've been keeping an eye on all of those packages to make sure that they get out to people. But of course, he will recognise that because it is public money, the schemes have to be set about in an appropriate way. Uh, that people come forward with proof that what they're asking for is appropriate. And uh, uh, my ministerial colleague did share with me the experience of someone who sent her in a receipt for shampoo and a receipt for a pair of scissors expecting to be paid £800 uh, for being a hairdresser. Now, as you well know, the Northern Ireland Audit Office is not going to accept that as proof. We need to go through the proper processes, and as I understand it, uh, those uh, in Part A now that are left are some of the more difficult cases uh, where proof has been sought either from accountants or from applicants themselves. Justin McNulty, supplementary. Thank the Minister for answering this far. Minister, that doesn't wash. Pardon the pun, given the, the example you've given. Um, there, there are genuine businesses out there who are on their knees and who need the money forthcoming fast. They need help. What is your Christmas message to those businesses who are asked to send workers home, close their doors, and were promised financial assistance but are still waiting for help? Let me say, remember, I certainly don't want the economy to be closed down. I certainly don't. Uh, I have been one of the people arguing to keep the economy open while others have argued to close it down. But the health message is very clear to us that we need to take action and the personal responsibility upon us all to take action to stop the spread of COVID-19 is very, very clear. Now, in terms of the uh, payments coming out either from the Department of Finance or from the Department of Economy, if there, are very, if there are specific instances, then they should do what my constituency office does, and I'm sure other constituency offices do, is phone the helpline, whether it's the Department of Finance or the Department of Economy, and try and get answers to deal with those issues. I'm not denying that there are people in need. Of course there are people in need. This has been a terrible, terrible year for businesses and for communities right across Northern Ireland. In our offices as elected representatives, we must do all that we can to help those people recognising that there are systems in place that have to be satisfied as well. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, this morning the head of the British Medical Association in Northern Ireland, Dr Tom Black, said that the current rate of COVID-19 infections uh, that we have is going to be a nightmare for our health service. Would you agree? Well, I certainly think that we're facing a very difficult time. I do welcome, however, uh, unlike others, I think it's important to give some hope to people uh, in our community. I very much welcome the fact that the vaccination programme is now rolling out. I welcome the fact that there is a hope that we will have all of the care home residents with their first vaccination uh, before Christmas. Uh, and, you know, I was looking at some figures over the weekend. Uh, I said to the member that 60 per cent of all COVID deaths in the UK are in the over 80 category. Now, as you know, uh, in the JCVI uh, recommendation for vaccination, uh, those are the people that come in phase one. So I very much hope that when they have received their second uh, vaccination, that, that will help us to move forward uh, towards normality, because of course they are the most vulnerable section of our society, and that's why they're being vaccinated first. So we need to have the vaccination programme in place, which I'm glad to say is rolling out well. I'm pleased to see that the second batch uh, of vaccinations arrived over the weekend. We need to have our testing regime in place, and both the Deputy First Minister and I visited the contact tracing service in Ballymena uh, on Friday to see the work that is going on there. And also we need to have personal responsibility so that we do go with those very basic messages that we've been talking about for so long now, which are so very important. Liam McLaughlin, supplementary. 
for, for that answer, and I agree people do need hope. But last week we had 98 deaths in Northern Ireland. Uh, currently, some of our hospitals are over capacity. Dr Black also indicated that a logical decision from the executive based on the facts, on the numbers, uh, that it would be uh, appropriate to for a, another uh, four-week lockdown. What's your thoughts on that, Minister? Well, I hope the member doesn't mind if I wait to hear from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor in relation to their advice uh, on these issues and taking into account where we are on our testing regime, on our vaccination programme and all of the other things. That, uh, because, you know, none of this is inevitable. I've said it many, many times. If people will just pull back, uh, uh, look at their social contacts, try to cut down on that, try to deal with all of the things in front of them, then it is not inevitable that we will have to do more restrictions. But unfortunately, it appears that our numbers are not where we would like them to be. So we will undoubtedly be having further discussions around this uh, in the days, either just before Christmas or after Christmas. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, First Minister, we now have uh, just over two weeks before the end of the Brexit transition period. Uh, on various occasions, we've had updates usually from written questions as to the volume of Brexit legislation the Assembly uh, was required to pass. We have, however, no idea of how much uh, is required before the end of the transition period. We've had little update from uh, the Executive Office on where our statute will be in the event of deal or no deal. Could you please today give us an update and give us confidence to this uh, Assembly of what we will be required to pass in the next two weeks, either deal or no deal? I well, thank the member for his question. The latest monitoring returns from the 10th of December on the volume of legislation required for the end of the transition period indicate that there are no assembly bills that are required to be brought forward before the end of the transition period. In terms of statutory rules, uh, uh, originally 78 statutory rules were identified. Uh, 15 of those have been deprioritised and will be laid as soon as possible after 20, and when we get into 2021. Of the remaining 63 statutory rules needed, 41 have already been laid and there are 22 still to be laid before the end of the transition, including one confirmatory rule which will be subsequently affirmed in 2021. In terms of Westminster legislation, there are nine Westminster bills, seven of which have had their first legislative consent motion. Uh, the Trade Bill and the UK Internal Market Bill remain under consideration by the Executive. To the First Minister for that update. It would have been helpful to have had it in, in written form so the whole Assembly could see it. Can I further ask, just further to our interaction earlier on in questions, um, Northern Ireland is going to be in a specific and unique position in relation to the protocol. No one uh, doubts that. There are debates in this House uh, about, the, the, about the benefits and disbenefits of the protocol, but it's clear that we will have privileged access to the EU single market and to the EU customs area. Can I ask her again to make specific representations on behalf of Northern Ireland Business in terms of maximising the benefits that we will have, deal or no deal, from our unique access to the EU single market and trade area? Uh, yes, and I'm sure he meant to say, and with access to Great Britain as well. So we will have access to uh, the full UK market and the EU market. And you know, Mr Speaker, that means that if you were a business coming over from America, or from somewhere else in the world and you were looking at access to the United Kingdom single market and access to the European Union single market, then Northern Ireland seems to be a very good place to locate yourself. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the, um, the First Minister uh, what the Executive Office knew about the Lambeth Palace legacy talks? Well, certainly from my perspective, I did not know that the uh, Lambeth talks were taking place until, and I think it may well have been the same source as the member learnt about uh, the talks. I was made aware that the talks were taking place, and we got a readout, and then subsequently some of my party colleagues uh, were in touch with the Archbishop of Canterbury's uh, office to find out what the situation was. But from my point of view, no, we didn't have any prior knowledge. Look, Bailey, something, uh, thank you, First Minister. And that, that's absolutely clear. But will the Minister agree with me that any legacy talks or strategies must include victims uh, and have victims' input? And indeed, um, everything that has been talked about in terms of legacy has always said that victims had to be at the very centre of any 
uh, process. And I welcome the fact that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has today confirmed that if victims are not going to be present at legacy talks in Lambeth, he will also not be present. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for the answers to the questions so far. For, uh, being from a border area, there is a great deal of uncertainty among border businesses worried about trade post-Brexit. Uh, while it is welcome trade talks will continue, many are sceptical of any tangible outcome. Uh, what assurances can the First Minister give to traders along the border who are rightly concerned about trade tariffs and the very future of their businesses? Well, as the member knows, because of the protocol, we can trade with the EU, and now because of what has happened in terms of the protocol and joint committee discussions, uh, we will be able to trade with Great Britain uh, as well. So that puts us in a different position than the Republic of Ireland and a slightly different position uh, than Great Britain as well. Having said that, I very much hope that we do uh, reach a negotiated outcome with a free trade agreement put in place which will benefit the whole of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, of course, in particular. I thank, you, thank the First Minister for the answer. Uh, can the First Minister give an absolute assurance that regardless of the ongoing negotiations and Tory politicking at Westminster, uh, that, her department will that her office will categorically and absolutely oppose any land border on this island? Well, I mean, the protocol has dealt with those issues. He knows that. And he knows uh, that what we need to do is also to ensure uh, that east-west there is unfettered access as well, because I'm sure he would want to ensure that businesses in Oman and Straban have access to the Great Britain market and that they're able to sell their goods uh, and services there. In terms of our readiness planning uh, at the executive, we have prioritised uh, six high-impact uh, risks. The first of those is in relation to, and this was before the protocol um, joint committee agreement, um, the first of those is food supply, second is the flow of highly regulated and priority goods such as medicine, uh, business preparedness, data flows, which is very important, uh, SPS facilities, and then transport is the sixth of those areas. And those are the areas that we are really focusing on, uh, and I hope that that gives uh, some comfort to his constituents that we are prioritising the risks and we are putting forward our operational readiness plans. They call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given one of the first things the UK government had to do after leaving the European Union was to negotiate a protocol with the Union for the movement of goods within the UK, does the First Minister accept that that gives a lie to the concept that Brexit was about taking back control? Well, in terms of the protocol, I think that um, there was a grave misunderstanding of the Belfast Agreement and what it meant. Uh, for the United Kingdom in terms of moving goods within the United Kingdom. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Theresa May uh, decided that she would go with the argument that that meant that there should be no infrastructure on the land border here uh, on the island of Ireland, and that led to a whole range uh, of issues. But look, we are where we are. We understand parliamentary sovereignty at Westminster. We understand that it has been voted through uh, last December and it became the Withdrawal Act uh, of 2020. So therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us uh, to try and mitigate against the worst excesses of the protocol uh, and to deal with the issues that are in front of us. Uh, I, thank, I thank the First Minister, but you know, given the expression take back control implies we did not have control when we were members of the European Union, does she not accept, do not understand that there are more restrictions now that were out than there were when we were in? I don't actually ex accept <coughs> excuse me, that that is the case. Uh, I think we will be free uh, of a lot of the rules in relation to the EU's customs union. We are, we are in the United Kingdom's customs union. Uh, we also have the advantage of being able to be in Northern Ireland and trade into the European Union and trade into uh, the rest of the United Kingdom market. So therefore, there are some things that we are taking control of, immigration obviously being one of those and uh, our money and our laws and all of the things that were talked about at the time. But look, I'm not making any excuse for the protocol. I voted against the protocol. It's not something uh, that I would have welcomed in any one way. However, uh, it has been voted through at Westminster. Therefore, it is my job to mitigate against the worst excesses of the protocol and to try and make sure that the people here in Northern Ireland can do their business in a proper way. 
Kelly Armstrong, but you'll get one question, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, First Minister, the level of awareness and knowledge of the common frameworks is extraordinarily low, and indeed the committee suggested there needs to be a level of increased coordination and communication. Can she explain what the Executive Office and the Department of the Economy are doing to make sure, in particular, the service sector are aware? Yes, I, I think the member is right that there isn't uh, an awful lot of knowledge of the common frameworks, and it's something that uh, we will have to take into notice after the transition period ends. There have been a number of common frameworks that have been worked through. A lot of them have been provisionally uh, agreed, and then there are some that are still to be worked through, and I hope that we can continue with that work in 2021. And time is up. Thank you. Members, could you take your raise a moment or two, please? Thank you.